Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Night Interactive Bible Study. We are so glad here at Abundant Life Church that you took the time to be with us and out of your schedule today. Remember, these lessons are interactive. We have pushed out worksheets. I would encourage you to follow along uh, in your homes or wherever you're watching this broadcast, uh, this live stream, and follow along with us and become involved. If you have a special prayer request or if you have any needs, or if you have questions, you can type those in. We have staff here at Abundant Life Church that's monitoring our feed, so just type your questions in. If it's something we can answer immediately, we'll get right on it. If it's something that needs some time or perhaps is a private request, we can handle those too. And looking forward to tonight's lesson, looking forward to what God is going to do. We had a great service Sunday. Brother Anthony brought a great word talking about being about our Father's business, and I think that is such a... Lesson that is applicable to us in our world today. We need to quit focusing on the things that don't matter and focus on taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone and being involved in the kingdom of God. Let's open with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much tonight for the opportunity to study your word. I ask that you would be with us, that you would lead us and guide us, that you would help us tonight, help us to be better stewards of our time, better stewards of the grace and mercy you've given to us. Help us to win a lost and dying world to you, and we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Tonight, we will continue in the book of Ephesians, and Brother Lentz is going to lead us off with chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1. So in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul is about to pray a prayer of intercession. He starts the uh, prayer off with, for this cause. So he's about to pray a prayer of intercession but he broke off his prayer at the end of this verse and entered an important digression into the nature of his ministry. Once he described his ministry and the suffering he endured for the believers, he resumed the prayer once again in Ephesians 3.14 with the words, For this cause. And the expression, I, Paul, is emphatic, intensifying the statements that follow. He identified himself as presently a prisoner, likely referring to his, his captivity in Caesarea or more likely Rome. And I've always found it very interesting, um, the whole story of Paul. He was a prisoner, and the reason he was a prisoner, the reason that he was arrested was because of his um, work in the kingdom of God for preaching the gospel. And so that was the same reason that he persecuted Christians back before he was converted, back before God saved him. He was persecuting, arresting Christians for their faith in God, for, for their preaching the gospel of Christ. And now here Paul is experiencing that too. And I, I don't believe it has anything to do with karma. I don't believe it has anything to do with what goes around, comes around. That was just the uh, nature of how the gospel was. And just like today in many countries, they are banned from preaching the gospel. You could be arrested or even killed for preaching the gospel. So I'm very thankful that we live in a nation currently at this present time where we have the freedom to come and worship. We have the freedom to, to preach the gospel. We have the, the freedom to preach the truth. So I'm very thankful for that. And um, in verse 2, the phrase, If ye have heard suggests that not all those who read the words of Paul knew him personally. It is likely, therefore, that this letter was a circular, circular letter sent to many house churches in Ephesus. Our word economy comes from the term rendered here as dispensation. And when you think of the word economy, when we think of the word economy, we think of the nation's economy, we think of money, we think of... Uh, our jobs and the money we earn, but God's economy is not based on money that we earn. God's economy is based on Him uh, giving Himself to us, not because we earned it, but because He loves us. And another big difference between God's economy and our economy is our economy can fail and will fail, but God's economy will never fail. And in Paul's day, it suggested the stewardship within God's family, which now was to include the Gentiles. In verses 3 through 7, it is revealed that 
Christ is the content of this mystery that was entrusted to Paul in, all, in the all-inclusiveness of the gospel. And this gospel drew both the Jew and the Gentile, and it's one of the caveats of the mystery that Paul was addressing. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 51, the mystery refers to the transformation of the believer on the last day. And in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, it refers to the final restoration of Israel. So although the Messiah was promised in the Old Testament, and though God promised Abraham that the Gentiles would be blessed through him, the Hebrew fathers did not foresee the joining together of these two people into one covenant and one body. So the mystery was also revealed and entrusted to the holy apostles as eyewitnesses of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And this served as the guarantors of the authenticity of the gospel. It's revealed to prophets who were contemporary with the apostles, who were also given insight by the Spirit. In verse 6, Paul made it clear that three of the elements of the mystery were revealed by the resurrection of Christ. Number one, Gentiles are fellow heirs of the same body with Jewish believers, and we are all partakers of the promise, this being Jews and Gentiles alike. Number two, the covenant God made with Abraham established the means by which one was justified. And then number three, as Abraham received this promise through faith, so all who believe become heirs according to the promise. The prospect opened the possibility that the Gentiles could receive salvation. This was opened up to them. This is where we find the gospel being preached to the Gentiles through this interaction, through this mystery being revealed. Therefore, when Paul spoke of the Gentiles being partakers of the promise in verse 6, he was implying language that corresponded to the encompassing, the gracious promises made to Abraham, and he was referring to the work and reception of the Holy Spirit as found in Galatians 3.14. So we find through the teaching of Paul that there was not a gospel for the Gentiles and a gospel that was exclusively for the Jews, but the gospel was for whosoever will, and we find that is still true in the church today. Uh, in verse number 8, Paul's praise to God intensified in his letters as he drew closer to his eternal reward. His admiration of God grew in direct inverse magnitude to his own self-estimation. And I believe that we as Christians can look at all the things that are happening in our world, all the chaos that's going on in our world, and we could be fearful, we could be apprehensive, we could be dreadful, but I don't believe that we should be any of those things because we need to understand that the closer uh, that the more the wicked the world becomes, the closer we are to our reward. And knowing that should cause us to praise God even more. It should cause our praise to intensify. It should cause our trust in God to intensify because all this is going to pass away. All this evil that we're seeing is going to pass away and we're going to be with God for eternity. So that should cause us to want to give God some praise and intensify our praise to Him. So Paul here was intensifying his praise as he drew closer to his eternal reward. In approximately 57 AD, Paul wrote that he was the least of the apostles. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. In about 62 AD, he explained here in verse 8 that he was the least of all the saints and spoke passionately of the unsearchable riches of Christ. Near the very end of his life, he stated that among sinners, he was chief and offered perhaps the highest praise ever written by pen to God. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The lowlier Paul seemed in his own eyes, the more glorious God became to him. So in order to magnify God, in order to make God seem bigger in our in our mindset, we have to make ourselves smaller. Paul was not boastful. He was not proud. He knew he, he was not proud of the the position that he was in, but he was very uh, humble. And uh, 
he knew that he was once a sinner and he was not perfect, so he uh, gave God the glory for it all. So the lowlier Paul seemed in his own eyes, the more glorious God became to him. In verse 10 for Paul, the body of Christ is the new creation that God is using to usher in the reality he has in store for the new heaven and the new earth. The church models the reconciliation and profound peace that will be the order of the day in the age to come, which is the millennial age, which happens after the rapture of the church. And here it is seen as taking its place as a cosmic authority and spiritual entity and serves notice to other spiritual powers that their uncontested dominion has been broken. And I think that is so important for us today, as I have said several times in the last few weeks. I believe that we are not only fighting a virus and we're fighting a, a spirit of division, but we are truly seeing spirits, evil spirits, unleashed on the face of the earth. And one day we can rest assured that the one true God will stand and, and stand notice or serve notice that He is the true God. And all the other spirits that have been loosed will have to bow before Him and have to submit to His ultimate authority because one day the church of the living God will declare the one true God and all the spirits that have been unloosed will be, will be tied back and be bound together and bound forever and the spirit of God will reign. In verse 14, the phrase, for this cause, signals that Paul was resuming the intercessory prayer that he began in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. And bowing is a standard posture of great humility and a tribute expressed toward the Almighty God. In verse 17, Paul addressed Gentile believers here who already possessed the Holy Spirit. His hope in this prayer was that this indwelling would be a permanent part of their lives rather than just a temporary experience. And God never meant for His Spirit to just be a one-time deal where you come and you speak in tongues, you feel the Spirit of God, you get that spiritual uh, boost, and uh, it's just something that you dwell on for the rest of your life and reminisce and tell your kids about, but that was the only time you ever experienced it. God intended for His Spirit to dwell in us for the rest of our lives. He, in he intended for us to have that experience at all times. Um, and uh, the way that we do that, the way that we experience God is we have to stay in tune with God. If I go a week or two without, without praying, without reading my Bible, and I wonder, I, I shouldn't wonder why I haven't felt God in a while. If I go two weeks without praying to God, I shouldn't be curious why I haven't felt the Spirit of God. It's something that we have to maintain. It's something that we have to do every day is we got to pray, we got to read our, the Word of God, we have to stay in tune with God so His Spirit can continue to dwell. The soil in which this permanent indwelling would take root was the knowledge of the profound, encompassing love of Christ. Interestingly, in verses 18 and 19, Paul did not pray that the believers would love Christ more but that the believers would have a greater understanding of the love of Christ. And in mentioning the four spatial dimensions, width, length, depth, and height, and applying no immediate object to them, the reader gets the sense that Paul has reached the very limits of language in describing the love of God, because the love of God surpasses human knowledge, and therefore the descriptive ability of language, Paul prayed, that believers could receive the kind of knowledge only the Spirit can impart. In verse 21, this doxology which welcomes and extols the unlimited Lordship of Christ ends with an amen. And that is, Paul ascribed all the glory to Christ and punctuated this prayer with an emphatic yes. Amen means let it be so. Amen is a sign of of confirmation. Amen is a sign that we accept what the speaker has spoken. And not only do we accept it, not only do we agree with it, but we also apply it to our life. So amen is just more than just a filler word in a service or when a preacher is preaching and bringing the word of God. Amen is a, is a signal that we confirm that, that we believe that. 
And basically what we're saying is let the words of that minister minister to me. Let me apply it to my life and let that be a confirming statement. Yes, I accept it. And as Paul had prayed for the church to assent to the sovereignty of Christ, he now modeled this assent with his own praise in verse 21. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul, having written of the realities that the works of Christ has made possible, he now addressed how the believer is to live as a result of the never-ending love of God. From here to the end of the letter, the rhetoric of the rhetoric of Paul turns to exhortation. Although the appearance of the church, which is the new creation, heralds the end of the age and provides the world and worldly powers with a glimpse of how God is going to create, recreate heaven and earth, the church, which is made up of unperfected human beings still in need of growth, has yet to reach its ultimate destiny. So none of us have reached the mark yet. I don't believe that you could ever reach a level of maturity in God that can't be improved upon. Whether you've been living for God five years, 50 years, I don't believe there's ever a point in your life where you've reached a point where you can't go higher in God, where you can't go deeper in God. So if I'm in the same uh, place where I was a year ago spiritually, I am, I'm in the same place today a year ago that I was spiritually then, and I haven't grown any, I haven't gone any deeper in my walk with God, then I need to examine my life and I need to uh, do it, whatever, I, whatever it takes, whatever I can do to go higher and go deeper in, in God because I need to be improving on my walk with God until God calls me home. So um, I need to make sure that I am walking with God. I need to make sure that I am reading the Word. I need to make sure that I am praying. I need to make sure that I have communication with God. I need to make sure that I am growing and improving. It's very interesting that Paul thinks of what it is to walk worthy of the Christian calling first in terms of Christian harmony. Divisiveness is an outright rejection of the calling and denies the revelation of the mystery, which, as Paul noted, In Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 9, entailed Jewish-Gentile reconciliation and modeled the forging of the one new creation out of the two natural enemies. Not surprisingly, the three virtues found in verse 2, which are lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering, are those pertaining to self-denial. Christ, the head of this new creation, exhibited these virtues in abundance on earth, and so must his body of believers, the church. We need to be like Christ in those aspects. It now becomes clear as to why Paul said that the body and blood of Christ abolished the the enmity between these two peoples. He provided the ultimate example of what it is to deny one's own rights and prerogatives for the sake of others, keeping in mind that Paul called himself a prisoner for the Lord in verses 1 and verse 3, he required that believers accept the bonds of peace. The contrast of the term bonds of peace seems to be a paradox and perhaps mutually exclusive because bonds confine and peace liberates. However, the phrase speaks to the reality that true peace comes at the highest cost. The willing limitations of one's liberties for the sake of achieving a higher corporate freedom in Christ. In verses 4 through 6, Paul had just called for unity in the strongest terms possible, and now he qualified its conditions because unity is not an end unto itself. This unity could be achieved only on the basis of apostolic doctrine, which is outlined by a series of seven articles of faith. Regarding these designations of the one God, he called attention to the Spirit in verse 4. This is probably because he had just mentioned the unity of the Spirit in the previous verse. The one hope of the call of the believer refers back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, where Paul stated that the one Spirit 
gives us access to the Father. The New Testament Christological term, one Lord, as found in verse 5, refers to the Son of God. Significantly, Paul mentioned one faith and one baptism in direct connection with this reference to this one Lord. That Jesus is Lord is the Christian's distinct confession. In the Pauline epistles, Lord often signifies Jesus in his exalted state and where he is universally acknowledged as such. The Lord Jesus was the name invoked at baptism as found in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. There is not one faith and baptism for the Jews and another one faith and baptism for the Gentiles. One God and Father in verse 6 speaks to the ultimate goal of the believer. And again, as we started this lesson, we made reference to the Jews and the Gentiles being bound together through faith and through the new birth experience. And again, Paul reiterates that with one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not many ways to heaven. There's not a couple of ways or three ways to be baptized. All of this is inclusive of one, and it is for everyone who believes. It is for the Jew and the Gentile alike. And then in verse 7, in Pauline thought, the versatile term grace is primarily viewed as a supernatural strength or power that signifies the distinct activity and presence of God. It is also a gift from God that enables the believer to fulfill his calling and his mission. In verses 8 through 16, in verse 8, Paul freely combined Numbers 18 and 6 in Psalms 68 and 18, a psalm that celebrated God's descent from Mount Sinai and his subsequent ascent to Mount Zion. Paul changed receive gifts from men to give gifts to men because Psalm 68 described in part an event recorded in number, Numbers 18 and 6. I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the taking and giving are snapshots of a single action. Paul was using one scripture to interpret another. In the synagogues of Paul's day, Psalm 68 was associated with the giving of the law and the Levitical priesthood to his people. His reason for using and freely quoting Psalm 68 then is clear. As God bestowed upon his people Israel the gift of those who would administer the duties of the tabernacle which housed the presence of God. So God has provided his people with ministers who will oversee and nurture the temple of the Holy Ghost, who are believers that have been born again. Like the tabernacle in the wilderness, the church houses the presence of God. God's descent from heaven is the incarnation and his ascent and distribution distribution of the soil the spoils of victory is described in terms of the glorification of Christ as found in verses 9 through 16 this concludes our lesson for this week and next week we will continue with our studies in the book of Ephesians and we will be moving on to verse 17 of chapter 4 please remember these studies are interactive if you have questions or if you have a prayer request please type those into the contact box and someone will be monitoring those and we'll take care of that for you. Also remember our live stream on Sundays at 12 o'clock noon and also remember that we are still open here at the church. We are practicing social distancing and abiding by the CDC regulations for uh, gatherings in our state. So if you would like to join us live, you can certainly do that. Uh, you can contact us through all of our social media outlets and would encourage you to stay in contact with our people associated with the church. Invite someone to watch the live stream. Invite someone to attend the Bible study. I believe this is where we're going to get our strength in the trying days that are ahead of us. I believe that with God being for us, who can be against us? This time, I would like for Brother Lentz to dismiss us in prayer, and we will see you guys next week. 
Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord, for yet another week. We thank you, Lord, for this Bible study. We pray that it touches somebody. We pray that it changes somebody's life. And we just thank you for your provision. We ask you, Lord, to protect us, Lord. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy, Lord. Protect us from the virus and protect us, Lord Jesus, from anything that would try to come between you and us, Lord, and we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.